In this video, we are going to discuss intellectual property. And your first question might be, what is intellectual property? Um, okay, so intellectual property, those are assets um, that are original creations of human intellect. So we're talking about inventions, computer software, literature, artistic works, uh, music, uh, movies, TV shows, screenplays, plays, um, but also um, like business names and symbols and, and logos that are used in commerce. And more specifically, the intellectual property laws, they protect the rights of owners and creators of patents, um, copyrights, and trademarks. So this is a little more interesting or a little more creative, right, uh, than uh, real property or personal property. You know, these are not houses and cars and stuff like this. Now we're talking about like creative works that um, are, have value and that are either bought and sold or, you know, certainly when we talk about like, you know, you think about movies, like some movies make billions of dollars. So it's very important to protect the ownership of that movie, the copyright. So other stuff, you know, sometimes we just, some people create things just for fun and maybe they don't necessarily have any any commercial value. And that's fine too. You can certainly protect that. I mean, if you own the created work and you don't want someone else using it, even if we're not talking about money, you know, that's that's part of your right as the owner. So let's first talk about patents, okay? So a patent, um, it's an exclusive right to decide who may use or reproduce, sell an invention. Um, it also includes like a process that provides a new way of doing something or offers a new technical solution to a problem. But for the most part, it's always going to be like an invention. You know, you invent something new or a twist on something old. Um, and patents last for 20 years. So you have exactly 20 years to make as much money as you can, be the only person in control of that invention. And then after the 20 years, other people could use it. So, you know, with tech, like, you know, especially modern day high tech, I mean, I don't even know if anything we use today is going to be around in 20 years, I guess some basics maybe, but, you know, you got to figure we've gone from, you know, 3G to LTE to now 5G for cell phones that, I mean, the patent for 5G may be basically worthless in 20 years because it's already been replaced with something we don't even think of, right? Um, but just examples of patents, just going back in time, the light bulb, you know, the light bulb somebody invented. Now, Thomas Edison was credited for inventing it and he owned the patent. Um, it's been said that he had inventors who worked for him and maybe one of his employees invented it. And then, you know, he took credit for it. And I guess legally that's fine if you hire an employee to do a job and create something and they do, um, you know, that's, that's the way that works. But history will tell you that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb again, whether he did or didn't, I mean, we know he owned the patent. So, um, the iPhone, Apple Inc., right? Good old Apple. They own the patent on the iPhone. And the way they kind of get out of the 20 years thing is that, you know, they've got new models coming out. They're constantly tweaking it and making changes to it. So uh, I think the first iPhone came out, I want to say 2007, maybe. Sounds about right. So um, we haven't even had 20 years of iPhones yet, much less, you know, taking into consideration the fact that we've had so many different types of of iPhones, but yeah, tech changes so quickly that I don't think we're really, you know, the companies that do that kind of stuff are really too worried about the 20 years. Um, but, you know, just to show you that it's not all cell phones and light bulbs and things like that, cars and TVs and whatever. Um, somebody patented uh, edible business cards. I don't know. What do you think about that? Like, I mean, we don't even really do business cards anymore, but like, what's the point of a business card that's edible? Hey, here's my, here's a card with my name and my phone number and my email address and my website. Also, it's made out of chocolate. So enjoy eating it. And then you eat it and you're like, ah, oh, I forgot to write down the guy's email address. I don't know, whatever. Um, sounds kind of silly to me, but this Leonard Kaufman dude came up with it and got a patent for it. 
So there you go. Um, how about the bong? How about a water pipe or a bong? Uh, that was patented by William Erickson. He's claimed as the person who created it and, and got a patent on it. So um, for that 20 year uh, stretch, if you wanted to uh, sell a bong, you had to pay Erickson a fee and get his permission. Patents are granted by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And it's the USTPO for short. Um, patents are very, very expensive. Um, they can cost up to 50 grand just in the filing fees and the attorney fees. So, you know, it's, this can't be some little rinky dink like, hey, I got an idea for, a, you know, some some little device to hold my iPhone, you know, so I can type on my computer and put my iPhone. There you go put my iPhone on my neck and it holds it out here so that I'm like typing on my computer and I can look to my right. And there's my phone, you know, some kind of neck iPhone holder, like how much money are you going to make selling that? You know, who wants to waste 50 grand on, on trade or patent fees. So, but you know, it's there, it's an option. And uh, the patent applications take forever. It can take up to three years. So you got to be really serious. This has got to be like, a, you know, like a replacement heart or a brand new cell phone that, you know, you can make billions of dollars off of. Um, and interestingly enough, only 11% of patent applications are approved. So the other 89%, they're rejected. Might be an invention, might be something you think is really cool, but patent office is like, no, it's not unique enough. It's not original enough. So we're not going to give you any legal protection. So it doesn't mean you can't go out and sell your iPhone neck holder you know so you can talk you, you can make those and sell those but it but somebody else could see it and go oh i can make those too maybe they can make it a little bit cheaper and put you out of business who knows but the government's like we're not getting involved in giving you legal protection so lots of things that are either silly or just lack utility or or uniqueness or newness you know they just get turned down they get their applications rejected and no you don't get your money back so there are Four main types of um, patents. All right, so let's take a look at those types of patents. So you have the utility patent. That's what most people will file. That's what most patents are. It protects inventions with a specific function. Um, but you also have a design patent, and that protects non-functional parts of an item, such as a unique shape or an aesthetic quality. So like I gave the example, a shape of a bottle. So Coca-Cola used to come in glass bottles with a specific shape. You know, you could tell it was a Coke bottle. Um, and so that's something they would want to, want to protect. But then after 20 years, you know, people go, well, that's a cool shape. So let's start using it. And then there's nothing to stop them because the patent's expired. Um, how about a plant patent? Plant patent. That's kind of hard to say. Plant patent. <laughs> a little bit of a tongue twister there. And also sounds kind of silly. You can patent a plant. As a matter of fact, you can. Protects plants such as flowers or vegetables that an inventor has created or discovered and then reproduced. So who do we know in the world that's coming up with new types of plants? Uh, my mind, uh, I, I do not smoke marijuana, but I go right to weed. I think of all the different strains. There's a great episode. Well, there's many great episodes in the office if you guys watch that, but there's a great line where they uh, find a joint in the parking lot. So Dwight begins, and this is, if you don't watch it, it's just like an office full of weirdos. And uh, so one guy decides, well, I'm going to conduct an investigation and figure out, you know, who's, whose joint is that? So he's asking this one guy, this is Creed, if you watch the show, and he says, you know, he shows him a picture of it and he goes, what is this? And it's like, a, you know, like a bud or whatever they call it. And, um, and Creed says that is California Indicus, Indicus, I don't even know the word, but he, he gives like a specific strain of marijuana. And then Dwight replies, no, it's marijuana. But anyway, so it was cute because clearly Creed knew it was marijuana and the guy asking the questions didn't. But um, that joke pops in my head a lot um, and I totally ruined it. So if you didn't think that was funny, trust me, it wasn't funny because my I didn't even my delivery was off. I can't even remember exactly what he said. But that's still no excuse for not going and watching The Office. Okay. So, yes, you can do a plant patent. But, you know, maybe you're coming up with new flowers. Maybe it's not just strains of marijuana. Maybe it's uh, new vegetables or something. I don't know. What's a what's a cool vegetable like a, um, like broccoli, 
and cauliflower, like a Brock flower, you know, and you put those together and, you know, I don't know. Um, oh, there you go. Ecuadorian sativa. There's an example. Um, and then the fourth kind of patent is a software patent. So that protects software. So like Microsoft Office, they have a, you know, they have a patent on that. So nobody can uh, copy their software. But it's interesting that they have like LibreOffice. I don't know if that's still around, but that was free and it could convert, um, you know, Microsoft Office documents, Excel and spreadsheets and, and Microsoft Word. But then also like Google Sheets and Google Docs, I think it's called, can also convert, I believe. So it's kind of interesting that it's like, well, their software is protected, but the output can then be converted and used on other software. So it doesn't do much good, but um, so that's patents, inventions, that sort of thing. Um, copyrights. Okay, copyrights are for works of art. So it's an exclusive right. Copyright is an exclusive right to copy, publish, distribute, display, perform a creative work that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So there's a lot of funky words going on there, right? So let's break that down. Exclusive right to copy, publish, distribute, display, perform. Okay, so that's anybody that wants to use something that's creative. Um, the owner of the copyright has the exclusive right. So they can say, yes, I will license you the use of that, um, whatever, that item, that song or that movie or whatever. Or no, I'm not going to license it to you. Music is the one that gets licensed the most often because, you know, how many times do we watch a movie and you hear a song and you're like, oh, it's a cool song or, you know, I like that song or maybe you've never heard it before. Um, especially when they do movies that are set in the past. So like a 1970s movie, you know, they're going to play some 1970s music. So, and they usually play like Fortunate Son by CCR or um, Machine Gun by the Commodores. Um, there's a couple other songs that just sound really, really like right out of the 1970s, depending upon if you're going for kind of the, you know, Vietnam era, if you're going for more the disco era. And someone owns the copyright to those songs. And the movie company, the producer will go and they will acquire the a license to use it. And then they will use it. And usually they got to pay a fee and then a, you know, um, some kind of uh, like viewing fee. Because if the movie blows up, you know, the music people want to make money off it. So, um, but the other part of that definition is that it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So it has to actually be a recording of a song or sheet music of a song um, or an actual screenplay or the movie itself. Um, it's not just the concept or the, the thought like, you know, Avatar. Well, I don't even know what Avatar is about. That's a bad example. But like, um, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to some examples. But copyrights last for the life of the author plus 70 years. So that's forever, right? Whereas a patent was just 20 years, just not even the life plus, it's just 20 years. So copyrights last a much, much longer life of the author plus 70 years. It has not always been 70 years. It used to be life of author plus, you know, 25 plus 50. And then now it's plus 70. And at some point, it'll probably change to plus 100. The reason why that number keeps changing is because of one human being. And that human being's name is Walt Disney. Why Walt Disney? Okay. So Disney, the corporation, owns the copyrights to lots of very valuable properties. Mickey Mouse, all those characters, Minnie Mouse, Goofy. Um, and then all the movies that they've done. Um, so, you know, the actual sort of like character, you know, the way, the way Mickey looks and all that, all that stuff's protected. But Walt Disney's been dead for a long time. I think he died in the 60s. So we're coming up on like 60 something years that he's been dead. Well, I mean, I, you know, Disney's not about to lose their sole exclusive right to control Mickey Mouse and all their other older properties. Um, so my guess is that um, they'll probably get the law changed. So if you see the law goes to 100 years, you can thank Disney for that. Um, but examples of things that can be copyrighted, we mentioned music and movies, but 
with music, yeah, it's the recording of the music or it's the written composition. There's actually two different copyrights. So someone can write the song and write it on sheet music, and then someone else can record it and own the copyright. Usually it's the same person, but sometimes with bigger bands, you know, they'll be a, like Diane Warren is a very famous songwriter who's written a million hit songs for a million different bands, you know, but she's, I think she's only maybe recorded music a few times in her life. It's usually you hear, you know, um, all these other famous artists recording her music. So she would own the copyright to the the written part and then the band would go record it and then they would own the copyright of the recording. And someone else could go take her sheet music, record their own version, and then they would own the copyright to their recorded version. So there are, you know, sometimes there are songs that are recorded by different bands and, you know, each record different singers and each recording has its own copyright. And then an old trick for old bands, when they sign some terrible record deal where they didn't own the copyrights to their music and maybe they were a big deal in like 1980 or something and it's been forever and really nobody cares but people like me who listen to 80s music that band will then re-record their music and then put out the new recordings with the hope that you won't buy the old ones for the old record company you'll buy the new ones and then they get all the money so that's that happens periodically so if you ever if you're on like spotify or something and you're listening to older music, maybe 80s music or 70s, and you're like, well, that sound that sounds right, but it's a little off. It's just a new recording of, with the same band. Um, movies, paintings, books, screenplays, photographs. Yes, a photograph can be copyrighted. So any sort of artistic, creative work um, can have a copyright. And the person that owns the copyright has the right to control who uses or reproduces that, that work. Um, now, here's a list of things that cannot be copyrighted. Names, okay? And I've got some examples of why, um, you know, or examples that show that, that a name is not protected. In the James Bond movies, um, there's a character named Q. And then in Star Trek... There is also a character named Q. So how can two different shows, one movie, one show, or several movies in one show, have um, the same character? Well, they're different characters. It's just the same name. And you do not have a protection for that name. So um, someone can take, like, um, can use a name. Like, let me think. Like, uh, Well, like in Star Wars, you've got Luke Skywalker. Somebody could write an entirely different movie that has absolutely nothing to do with Star Wars or Luke Skywalker. And maybe it's about a guy who runs a restaurant and, you know, he finds out he's got terminal cancer. I don't know. It sounds like a terrible movie, but um, there's my example for you. And the writer decides to name the chef and the owner of the restaurant, Chef Luke Skywalker. He can absolutely do that. That name is not protected. The character of Luke Skywalker is protected. It's just not the name. So I know that sounds confusing. Um, now, words, you can't just trademark a word or, or a phrase, but you can protect it through a trademark. So that's why I put C, trademark, for words and phrases. And same thing with names. Names would fall under trademarks as well. But none of those are something that's protected by copyright. And a title, a title of a work is not protected. Um, there is a movie... In well, in 2012, we had a movie about the Avengers from the Marvel Universe that everybody loves, right? Everybody loves Marvel. But if you go back to 1998, there was a movie called The Avengers, and it had nothing to do with Marvel, it had nothing to do with superheroes. It was about British spies, and it was based on an old TV show. And that's because two works of art can have the same title. The title itself is not protected, it's the work itself. So you know, if the 1998 Avengers movie had included um, a reference to a scientist who, when he gets angry, turns green and becomes a giant Hulk of a person, then you'd have a problem, right? Because that sounds like you're describing the Incredible Hulk. Um, now, this is critical, the last one, okay, in things you cannot copyright, things that are not protected, ideas. So if you are, uh, say, an aspiring screenwriter and you come up with an idea for a movie, which, by the way, don't steal my cancer guy opens a restaurant 
because I'm going to write that someday. No, I'm kidding. That sounds terrible. Who would want to watch that? But let's say you came up, maybe you're an aspiring screenwriter and you came up with a cool idea or an original idea no one's ever heard of, no one's ever thought of. Well, don't go tell people because that idea is not protected. You have to actually, um, it has to be, uh, let's go back and look at the exact definition. Um, fixed in a tangible medium of expression, right? So an idea is not fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So an idea for a screenplay is just that, it's an idea. You have to actually write the screenplay and then everything in the screenplay is protected. So if you had an idea for restaurant owner, chef with cancer, and you told that to somebody, they could go write that movie and there's nothing you could do. But once you go and you actually write it, if they write the same or similar screenplay, then then you might have, have an issue. And I specifically picked a terrible idea because you know nobody's going to try to steal that. Who cares, right? Um, so your ideas are never protected. So be careful that you don't just pitch it. If you know, if you're into screenwriting or into coming up with creative stuff, you know, maybe a book idea or something. Um, copyrights are automatically created. So when a work has been created, you automatically have a copyright. Um, once it's been fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So once you've typed out that screenplay, it's now protected by copyright law. You don't have to register it to get copyright protection. But, and this is a big, big, but, well, that sounds terrible to say it's a big, but it's a, it's a big caveat. It's a big, okay, hang on. You should, however, always register a copyrighted work and you do that with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, again, it's optional, but you should do it because it creates a public record of your ownership of the work. So it's proof of ownership, proof of the date. If somebody later on wants to say, well, you know, it was my idea to do cancer guy opens a restaurant and then you go to the copyright office and you look up your your script and it shows that it was 2023 this other person wrote theirs in 2027 then you're going to win you're the, it's clearly your copyright and they violated your copyright so um again you don't have to register it but you really should just if, if it's something that you've created and that you think may have commercial value um you should do it certainly um to protect yourself against a lawsuit um because remember, they could sue you and say, well, you're the one trying to use my idea. And you're like, what are you talking about? It was my idea first. Look, here's my screenplay and it's registered. So whatever. And you register it again. It's with the U.S. Copyright Office. So there's an application. So it's a documentation. You fill it out. You send a copy of the work, which is difficult if it's a sculpture or a movie, right? You have to put it on some sort of disc or something. And then, you know, you send it in and uh, pay the fee. Uh, back in the old days for music as a musician, I've done a lot of copyrights and as an attorney, I've also done a lot of that. But, um, you know, we used to just record our music on cassette tapes and send it off to the copyright office. No big deal. Now it's a little more different, difficult because we don't even use CDs anymore. So I don't know. I haven't done a copyright in a while. So it makes me wonder what the musicians are doing if they're you know doing USB drives or, you know, I don't know. The fair use doctrine permits a very limited, unlicensed use of copyrighted work, something that would otherwise be protected, but because of fair use, you actually have a very limited right to use it. There's just a couple of um, exceptions of use under the fair use doctrine. And so the first one is education. So for example, if I wanted to show you guys a clip as a professor, I wanted to show my students a, a movie clip that was relevant to something we were learning or, or part of our discussion. I could do that. And that would not be a copyright violation. Now, if I just wanted to say, hey, uh, you know, we're we're going to do a, you know, uh, we're going to do a movie day and we're going to watch The Godfather or I don't know, whatever. Godfather's a great movie. Um, and yeah, it's a cool movie. Let's watch it. I mean, it just, you know, I can't just show the whole movie without permission, um, but I can certainly show clips like if my, you know, if we're doing a class on copyright, I don't know, that might be a bad. Um, mm, yeah, I'm sure there's some good movies with copyrights or trademarks or patents or something in there. You know, we patents, there's lots of inventions. So we could, I could show you a clip about a, 
from a movie about an invention or whatever. But um, if it's just something that's educational in nature, in other words, I'm using the clip, I'm using the copyrighted work, or maybe I, I take an article or a, a, a section from a book. I can't take the whole book, but like a section to distribute to you guys because it's related to the lesson uh, or the lecture. Then, yeah, I can do that because it's protected under the fair use doctrine because it's for education. Um, now, you can't go and download pirated movies and say, oh, I'm just trying to learn about movies. You know, that's not going to fly. Um, another way to uh, another exemption under fair use doctrine is news reporting. So if it were a news program, they were doing news stories about current events and they wanted to show a clip like maybe it was movie reviews. They were like, oh, there's a you know, brand new movie coming out about a, <laughs> a guy with cancer that opens a restaurant and uh, it's an awesome movie, you know, um, and they wanted to show a little clip. Yeah, they could do that. You know, of course, you'd probably let them show the clip because you want people to know about the movie because you want them to go see it or stream it or whatever. Um, and then the final use fair use doctrine um, exemption is parody. So we see this on SNL or maybe like a TikTok video or something. Somebody's just making fun of something. So like on SNL, you know, they make they might in their intro, they might make fun of like a Fox News bit or something. And so they'll start with the Fox News graphics and you're like, whoa, those are like exactly the Fox News graphics. How are they legally able to do that? Well, it's just parody. They're just making fun of it. So then they're allowed to do it. They're allowed to use it under the fair use doctrine, because trust me, Fox News is not interested in being made fun of <laughs> by SNL or anyone. So, you know, the fact that SNL does it, you know, you know, it's NBC. They've got lawyers, so they're they're totally protected. So we talked about patents. We talked about copyrights. Patents are inventions. Copyrights are like creative works of art. Now let's talk about trademarks. So a trademark is a word. So think about like a product name or a business name. So a word or a phrase, you know, think about a slogan, um, a symbol or a design of some kind. So think about a logo. It's all of those. And that any of those that identify a like goods or services of a business, and it kind of distinguishes their brand from the competition. Um, so that's essentially what a trademark, oh, that's what a trademark is. And the owner of a trademark has the exclusive right to use that trademark. No one else can use it without their permission. That kind of is the same way with, you know, you'll see a central theme there with intellectual property is that trademarks, copyrights, um, and patents are all protected by law. And so someone else can't use them or reproduce them or whatever. Um, now we have trademarks and we have service marks. Trademarks are associated with goods. So like, you know, phones or computers or, you know, something, some tangible product, whereas a service mark would be associated with a service, like maybe a tax prep service or, you know, maybe like a cell phone repair company or something like that, or like delivery, you know, like FedEx is a delivery company. They don't, they don't sell products. They sell you the service of delivery, delivering goods, um, and you would register your trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So notice there that the United States Patent and Trademark Office is patents and trademarks. So it's interesting that those two get put together, but then the Copyright Office is completely separate. Um, so patents and trademarks, same office, copyright, separate office. And trademarks, they don't expire. So patents were 20 years Copyrights were life of the author plus 70. So when the author dies, then you get another 70 years beyond that. Um, but trademarks, they don't expire so long as the trademark is continuing to be used. So if it was, oh gosh, like um, uh, I think in the, in the business ethics video, we talk about the Ford Pinto. So if um, well, not if, but Ford does not make Pentos anymore. So if they stop using that name, then that trademark expires. They don't have the exclusive right to use it. Now, lucky for Ford, nobody in their right mind would <laughs> want to call their car a Ford Pinto, knowing how horrible those cars were. And they killed a lot of people. So um, that's why they abandoned it. They don't use it anymore. But, you know, for the most part, uh, Sometimes manuf car manufacturers stop making a model. Maybe they want to come back to it. So they have to figure out a way to keep using that name 
um, so that it's still protected, so it doesn't expire. So let's look at some examples of trademarks. You know, we talked about patents being inventions and copyrights, movies and music and all that kind of stuff. But what's a what's a trademark? Well, look at the left column there. The word Microsoft, that's a trademark. They have an exclusive right to use that for computer software. And, you know, Microsoft's been dabbling in a lot of different stuff. They used to do, you could get a mouse and a keyboard that's from Microsoft, Um I forget what else they've been into, but mostly it's been software, you know, operating systems and um, and then their office system. Um, but they absolutely have a trademark on that word, Microsoft. Um, iPhone, that's a trademark name. Um, how about Nike? Just do it. That's their slogan. So that is a trademark. Just do it. And then Subway has the trademark Eat Fresh, which I don't, is that a good trademark? I don't, it sounds kind of lame to me, but um, but that's their trademark. And um, it's protected. So if Nike wanted to say, ooh, buy our new Nikes, eat fresh, like they couldn't say that because that's Subway. And likewise, you know, McDonald's can't say, come to McDonald's, eat fresh. You know, that's that's Subway's trademark. And then if you look at the right side of the screen, <clears throat> you'll see all these graphic images, right? Those are also trademarks. So here's Microsoft again. So you're telling me Microsoft has more than one trademark? Yes, and most companies do have many trademarks. So in the case of Microsoft, just the word itself, in any font, any size, just those letters put together in that order, Microsoft, that's a trademark. Then, and I think this is their current version, it's the word Microsoft with those four squares, the red, the blue, the green, and the, I guess, amber Um so that is Microsoft's trademark. So no one else can use that. Then you see that that Apple with the byte taken out. Well, that's Apple computers. We all recognize that. And that's the whole point of the trademark is that we now recognize, for example, the Apple. We all know that's Apple. That's iPhones, MacBooks, all the stuff, the cool stuff that Apple sells. So you don't want someone else to make a vastly inferior product, slap that logo on it, and you see it. And uh, you think, oh, well, it's made by Apple. It's probably going to be pretty good. I think I'll buy it. Meanwhile, it's it's some you know piece of junk that Apple would never in a million years make. So um, that's why you you have these the, the trademarks and the protection from other people using them is to you know to protect their brand. Then you see the Nike swoosh over there. That's gosh, that's been around for almost fifty years at this point. And then YouTube, um, and then. Uh, I'm I'm super old, so I don't know a lot of uh, tech and apps, but I believe, <laughs> well, Spotify, right? So there's Spotify, it's in the name. And then that leaves one, which I think is Instagram. <laughs> so uh, I did make this slide. Um, I just don't, it doesn't say Instagram and I don't use Instagram. So um, I don't remember for sure. But uh, if it is Instagram, then awesome. I got it right. If it's not, then I'm sure everyone's laughing at whatever it really is and how incredibly lame it is that I don't know what that logo is. But again, I'm pretty sure it's Instagram. Um, so everything on this page, right? All these examples, um, those are all trademarks, whether it's the graphic image or the word or the words, those are all protected um, by the owners of the trademark. So Apple owns that logo, Nike owns the swoosh. I don't know who, I think Google owns YouTube. I don't know who owns Spotify or I think Instagram might be Facebook. So Meta, I don't know. So there's examples of trademarks. Um, now let's look at some things that cannot be trademarked. Remember with copyrights, you know, if it's just an idea, it can't be copyright or if it's just like a word or a name. So anything that is the same or similar to, same as or similar to an existing trademark whether it's exactly the same or deceptively similar, cannot be trademarked. So you cannot trademark Microsoft, M-I-K-R-O-S-O-F-T. So like Microsoft is M-I-C, if you subtract, if you replace the C with a K, no, because it still sounds like Microsoft. It just has one letter different. So that's, that's confusing to the public, right? Now we would, I mean, with discerning eyes, you would go, that doesn't look right. Mm, oh, M-I-K, yeah, I thought Microsoft was a C. No, it's definitely a C. 
you don't have to play that game. You know, Microsoft is protected. So any word that sounds similar, no, you can't use it. Any sort of common words or phrases like the word cell phone, you know, the word car, the word account, these, these are just generic terms that are used often. So you can't, um, you, you can't trademark a word like that. So you might be able to trademark like Microsoft Office, but Microsoft does not own a trademark on the word office because um, that's a common word. Um, any kind of generic or descriptive terms, excellent, superior, award-winning, none of that. Yeah, um, excellent software. Or how about a company that puts out a product called Superior Cell Phone? You know, Superior Cell Phone 1.0. Yeah, they're not going to get a trademark on that because the word superior is pretty generic. The word cell phone is very common, um, you know, so nothing descriptive, nothing common. Um, it's not uh, not going to be protected uh, by trademark law. Proper names, right? So my name is Craig Black. Anyone can use the name Craig Black. I can use it because it's my name or anyone else with that name can use it. So I can't trademark the Craig Black law firm and say, well, that's, you know, that's my my brand. Uh, it's my service mark because I provide legal services and then think that I'm going to prevent another attorney named Craig Black from using it. And trust me, there are other attorneys in the state of Texas named Craig Black. I know of at least two, which is really weird because I consider this to be an odd name. Prior to Craigslist, nobody knew how to spell my name or what the hell my name meant. Everybody just thought it was Greg or something like that. And now, thanks to Hollywood, I notice every wimpy guy in the world that's a character in a movie is named Craig. So um, I pride myself on, um, let's see, how do I put this politely? Um, I'm very tall. I'm physically fit. I'm in good shape. Um, I'm, uh, you know, some people might even say I'm funny. Um, that's debatable. But nevertheless, um, being kind of a wimpy dude is not at all how anyone who knows me personally would describe me. So thanks, mom, <laughs> for giving me that name. But anyway, I can't really trademark it. And, and I've already got my retirement name picked out after I retire and disappear to Italy or Australia or wherever I move to. I'm going to change my name and, and then just become a whole brand new person. So when I disappear after I retire, you guys will know, oh, he... He picked that new name. We have no idea what it, what, what it is, but it's a much cooler name than Craig. Um, all right. Uh, but anyway, the point is you can't trademark uh, a name. And I'll give you a great example of that. Um, I got this from a friend of mine who was working on a case with, um, I guess I can say it. I don't think it matters, but it was um, Pearl Vision. I'm not even sure if they're around anymore, but like Lens Crafters and I forget all the other names, but the places where you go and you get your glasses made, assuming, well, now you can buy them online. But in the old days, we had to like drive to these optical places and overpay hundreds of dollars just to get glasses. And Pearl Vision was maybe not the, the most well-known, I'm like Lens Crafters and there was some other one that was similar, but anyway... They were maybe the number three out of three. And so this is a buddy I went to law school with, and he was telling me that um, they would send out a, a cease and desist letter to anybody that was violating Pearl's trademark. And there was a uh, a guy who was an optician in, I don't know, I'm thinking Florida. I guess it doesn't really matter, but he had opened a store um, where, you know, he, he gave eye exams and he sold glasses and it was called Pearl Vision, just like the nationally known chain Pearl Vision. And so Pearl Vision, the big corporation, sent him a cease and desist. And he wrote back and he said, all right, here's the deal. My name is Pearl. And so I'm allowed to use that name. His name was like Bob, Dr. Bob Pearl or something. And he goes, and also I've been using the name Pearl Vision long before you guys started using it. So you're actually violating my trademark. So I want you guys to stop. So yeah, needless to say, Pearl Vision was like, you know, the, the corporation was like, no, it's cool. Yeah, it's fine. You can keep the name. We don't mind, you know, because they didn't have any standing. You know, first in time, that guy got it. Plus it was his name. So can't you can't uh, trademark the word optical. So trademarking Pearl Optical for a guy named Bob Pearl, it's a no brainer. So um Kind of interesting, right? That that uh, you know, 
uh, well, I don't know if interesting is the word, but you know, big corporation trying to press push around a little guy with his, his business. And then he's like, no, 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 you're, I'm going to push you guys around. So I thought that was kind of an interesting story. Um, you cannot trademark government symbols. So the American flag or, you know, I was trying to think of some symbols that people might want to trademark. I don't know, like, you know, Statue of Liberty or something like that. But, you know, if it's something the government owns, you can't incorporate that symbol into your trademark. So, yeah, you can't you can't take a government flag, like the United States flag, put your face on it and, you know, and try to make that your logo. You know, that's not going to work. Um, any vulgar or disparaging words or phrases. Now, if you notice, I didn't put any example. <laughs> When I was preparing the slide, I was like, okay, vulgar or disparaging words or phrases, colon, and then let me put my examples. I was like, oh, uh, never mind. Uh, so, no, I'm not going to give you guys an example of vulgar or disparaging words or phrases. You will just have to use your own imagination as to what a vulgar or disparaging word or phrase. Disparaging is when you speak ill of someone else. So, um, yeah, curse words, four-letter words. That's not something you can trademark. Um, immoral, deceptive, or scandalous words or symbols. Okay, so now we're not talking about curse words. We're maybe talking about more sex type stuff, you know, images, graphic images of things, body parts and things. That's not, you're not going to get a trademark approved for that, you know. Certainly anything uh, that's deceptive, like back to the Microsoft, trying to fool somebody to make them think you're Microsoft, that's not going to fly. Immoral, that's a tough one because morality is is really kind of up to someone's own judgment. What is, you know, what I find immoral, you might not find immoral and vice versa. So, but we'll we'll stick with the sort of sex type stuff, you know. So dirty words and sex images, you're not going to get that stuff trademarked. That's not going to fly. Now, you've probably seen some of these symbols with words and maybe didn't know what they meant or maybe thought, well, whatever, it's kind of weird. Or maybe, maybe you knew it kind of had to do with the copyright. But there's actually three different symbols, or not copyright, but the trademark. Um, but there's three different possible symbols you can use with a trademark. These are totally optional. You don't have to use them. But by using them, it identifies to the world that this phrase or word or symbol is a protected trademark or service mark. So the first one is an R with a circle. And that just simply means that it's a registered trademark. So it's been registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office because not all trademarks are registered. It's, it, if you're the first one to use it and you go out there and use it in business, then like the example I gave with the Pearl, Bob Pearl's, you know, Bob's Pearl Vision, he'd been using it before the big corporation. He'd been using it for 40 years. So you know, he had the legal right to it, um, at least in Florida, where where he was. You know, maybe he didn't use it uh, throughout the whole country, which is, that's a different story. But but the R with the circle, that means registered. Then if you see TM, it could be registered, could be unregistered, but it just simply means this is a trademark. And likewise with the SM, you put that to mean service mark, could be registered, could be unregistered. But if it is, uh, but if you use the R, then it absolutely has to be registered. Only the registered trademarks can have the R with the circle. And again, these are these are optional, but most of the time you'll find that they're they're used when appropriate. Um, so let's look at here's a picture of two well-known um trademarks. Um, first one is FedEx, so the delivery company. And you see right next to FedEx, they have um a uh, an R with a circle showing you that it is a registered trademark. Now I want to point out something unique that maybe you didn't notice about the FedEx logo. Okay, so this is a little funky um, and I can't really highlight it. So you have to just sort of use your imagination and follow me, but, but you see the letters in FedEx, right? So go from the Fed, F-E-D, skip that part, go to the X. Now look at the bottom half of the E and the left half of the X. So the E is an orange and the X is an orange. But look at the white area between the E and the X. Again, the bottom of the E and the X. Do you notice that symbol in white is actually an arrow pointing forward? And that's intentional. That's FedEx trying to be like, oh, we're moving forward with your package. So um, I said clever, but 
I don't know how clever that is, but that's again, that's that's intentional. And then the one on the right, I'm pretty sure is Starbucks. I don't drink coffee. And before you before you say, wait, you don't drink coffee. What's wrong with you? I don't know. I'm just kind of a healthy living freak. I don't I don't put any caffeine in my body, so um, so I don't drink coffee. Um, I would love to tell you it was some cool reason or whatever, but no, it's just I don't have a taste for it, and I don't put caffeine in my body, so um, so I don't drink coffee. But I'm pretty sure that's Starbucks. And look very closely at the Starbucks logo and you will see a, no, I'm kidding. There's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything hidden in, you will see a tiny picture of Ronald Reagan hidden. No, I don't know. Uh, maybe there is. It'd be interesting to see. Although she looks like she's, it looks like a woman wearing a crown and she's got two things in her arms. I don't see her hands. So I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but anyway, right next to, that fun logo, um, which again, don't make fun of me if it's not Starbucks. I'm pretty sure it's Starbucks. Um, but right next to it is a TM. And again, that just means trademark. Could be registered, could not be. If it's Starbucks, I can guarantee you they spent the money to register their trademark. Um, so there you go. So that's intellectual property, which is patents, copyrights, and trademarks. And that concludes our lecture on intellectual property.